Welcome to Brainish English Stories. One day, Andy Donovan went to eat dinner at his home on 2nd Avenue. Mrs. Scott introduced him to a new person, Miss Conway. She was a small and quiet lady. She wore a simple brown dress and seemed not very interested in anything. Miss Conway looked at Andy once and said his name. Then, she went back to focusing on her food. Andy smiled at her and erased the thought of her dress from his mind. Two weeks later, Andy sat on the front steps, enjoying his cigar. There was a soft sound behind him, and he turned around. Coming out of the house was Miss Conway. She wore a black dress made of thin black fabric called crepe de chine. Her hat and veil were also black, and she put on black silk gloves. No white or any other color in her outfit. Her shiny golden hair was neatly tied at the back. Her face was plain, not very pretty, but it looked different now. Her big grey eyes stared sadly at the sky above the houses. Imagine, girls, all black, especially the crepe to chine. The sad look, the shining hair under the black veil, you need to be blonde, and act as if your young life was spoiled just before stepping into life's journey. A walk in the park might help, and make sure to leave the house at the right moment, oh, it will surely attract attention. But, you know, it's funny how cynical I am, talking about morning clothes like this. Suddenly, Mr. Donovan started thinking about Miss Conway again. He threw away his almost finished cigar and adjusted his position on the steps. It's a nice, clear evening, Miss Conway, he said with confidence. If the Weather Bureau heard him, they would have raised the white flag and put it on the mast. To those who have the heart to enjoy it, it is, Mr. Donovan, said Miss Conway with a sigh. Mr. Donovan, in his heart, didn't like the good weather. I'm feeling weather. It should rain or snow to match Miss Conway's mood. I hope none of your family... Hope you didn't have a loss, asked Mr. Donovan. Someone passed away, said Miss Conway, pausing, not a family member, but someone important. But I won't bother you with my sadness, Mr. Donovan. Bother, objected Mr. Donovan. Why, Miss Conway, I'd be happy, I mean, I'd be sorry. I'm sure nobody could understand and feel sorry for you more than I would. Miss Conway smiled a little smile, sadder than her usual expression. Laugh, and the world laughs with you, weep, and they give you the laugh, she quoted. I've learned that, Mr. Donovan. I have no friends in this city. But you've been kind to me. I appreciate it a lot. He passed her the pepper twice at the table. It's hard to be alone in New York, that's for sure, said Mr. Donovan. But hey, ah, whenever this little town becomes friendly, it goes all the way. What do you think about taking a walk in the park, Miss Conway? It might help shake off some of your worries. And if you'd let me. Thanks, Mr. Donovan. I'd be happy to go with you if you think the company of someone with a heavy heart would be okay for you. Through the open gates of the old downtown park, they walked and found a quiet bench. There's a difference between the sadness of young and old people. When young people share their sadness, it feels a bit lighter. But old age may share and share, and the sadness stays the same. He was my boyfriend, shared Miss Conway after an hour. 
We were going to get married next spring. Don't think I'm making up a story, Mr. Donovan, but he was a real count. He had a big house and a castle in Italy. His name was Count Fernando Mazzini. He was so elegant. My dad didn't like him, of course. Once we ran away, but my dad caught us and brought us back. I thought for sure my dad and Fernando would fight. My dad has a business in Paukeepsipsi, you know. Finally, my dad agreed and said we could get married next spring. Fernando showed him proof of his title and wealth. Then he went to Italy to prepare the castle for us. My dad is proud, and when Fernando wanted to give me money for my wedding clothes, my dad was very angry. He didn't let me take any gifts from him. When Fernando left, I came to the city and got a job as a cashier in a candy store. Three days ago, I got a letter from Italy, forwarded from Paukeepsipsi, saying that Fernando had died in a gondola accident. That's why I'm in mourning. My heart, Mr. Donovan, will always be with him. I might not be good company, but I can't be interested in anyone else. I don't want to keep you from your fun and friends who can make you smile and entertain you. Maybe you'd prefer to walk back home? Now, girls, if you want to see a young man move quickly, just tell him that your heart belongs to someone else in a grave. Young men are naturally drawn to sad stories. Ask any widow. Something must be done to bring that missing heart back to the weeping angels in black dresses. Dead men surely face challenges from all sides. I'm really sorry, said Mr. Donovan gently. No, we won't go back home just yet. And don't say you don't have friends in this city, Miss Conway. I'm very sorry, and I want you to believe I'm your friend and that I'm really sorry. I have his picture in my locket, said Miss Conway after wiping her eyes with her handkerchief. I never showed it to anyone, but I'll show it to you, Mr. Donovan, because I believe you're a true friend. Mr. Donovan looked at the photo in the locket for a long time. Count Mazzini's face was interesting. It was a smooth, Intelligent, bright, and almost handsome face, the face of a strong, cheerful man who could be a leader among his friends. I have a bigger one, framed, in my room, said Miss Conway. I'll show you when we get back. These are all I have to remember Fernando. But he'll always be in my heart, for sure. Mr. Donovan faced a delicate task to replace the unfortunate count in Miss Conway's heart. His admiration for her motivated him. But the difficulty of the job didn't seem to bother him. He played the role of a sympathetic and cheerful friend so well that, in the next half hour, they were talking thoughtfully while enjoying ice cream. Still, the sadness remained in Miss Conway's big grey eyes. Before they said good night in the hallway, she ran upstairs and brought down the framed photo wrapped in a white silk scarf. Mr. Donovan looked at it with mysterious eyes. He gave me this the night he left for Italy, said Miss Conway. I had the one for the locket made from this. A good-looking man, said Mr. Donovan with enthusiasm. How about joining me for a trip to Coney Island next Sunday afternoon, Miss Conway? A month later, they told Mrs. Scott and the other people they lived with about their engagement. Miss Conway continued to wear black. A week after the announcement, 
The two sat on the same bench in the downtown park, the leaves fluttering around them in the moonlight. But Donovan had a gloomy look all day. Tonight, he was so quiet that Love's lips couldn't hold back the questions that Love's heart wanted to ask. What's wrong, Andy? You seem so serious and moody tonight. Nothing, Maggie. I know better. Can't I tell? You never acted this way before. What is it? It's nothing much, Maggie. Yes, it is, and I want to know. I bet it's some other girl you're thinking about. Okay, why don't you go get her if you want her? Take your arm away, if you please. I'll tell you then, said Andy, wisely. But I guess you won't understand it exactly. You've heard of Mike Sullivan, haven't you? Big Mike is Sullivan, everyone calls him. No, I haven't, said Maggie. And I don't want to, if he makes you act like this. Who is he? He's the biggest man in New York, said Andy, almost reverently. He can do almost anything he wants with Tammany or any other old thing in politics. He's a mile high and as broad as East River. Say anything against Big Mike, and you'll have a million men on your collarbone in about two seconds. He even made kings hide like rabbits when he visited the old country. Well, Big Mike's a friend of mine. I'm not influential in the district, but Mike's as good a friend to a little man or a poor man as he is to a big one. I met him today on the Bowery, and guess what he does? He comes up and shakes hands. Andy, he says, I've been keeping tabs on you. You've been doing good work on your side of the street, and I'm proud of you. What'll you take to drink? He takes a cigar, and I take a highball. I told him I was getting married in two weeks. Andy, he says, send me an invitation, so I'll remember it, and I'll come to the wedding. That's what Big Mike says to me, and he always keeps his word. You might not get it, Maggie, but I'd give up one of my hands to have Big Mike Sullivan at our wedding. It would be the happiest day of my life. When he goes to a man's wedding, that guy is set for life. Now, that's why I might look upset tonight. Why don't you invite him, then, if he's so important, said Maggie, lightly. There's a reason why I can't, said Andy, sadly. There's a reason why he mustn't be there. Don't ask me what it is, because I can't tell you. Oh, I don't care, said Maggie. It's something about politics, of course. But it's no reason why you can't smile at me. Maggie, said Andy, do you like me as much as you did the Count Mazzini? He waited a long time, but Maggie did not reply. Then suddenly, she leaned against his shoulder and began to cry, holding his arm tightly, wetting the black fabric with tears. There, 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 comforted Andy, putting aside his own trouble. What is it now? Andy, sobbed Maggie, I've lied to you, and you'll never marry me or love me any more. But I feel that I have to tell. Andy, there never was a Count Mazzini. I never had a boyfriend in my life. But all the other girls had one and they talked about them, and that seemed to make the guys like them more. And, Andy, I look good in black, you know I do. So, I went out to a picture store, bought that photo, had a small one made for my locket, 
and made up that story about the Count and his death so I could wear black. And nobody can love a liar, and you'll reject me, Andy, and I'll die of shame. Oh, there was never anyone I liked but you, and that's all. But instead of pushing her away, Andy's arm folded her closer. She looked up and saw his face clear and smiling. Could you, could you forgive me, Andy? Sure, said Andy. It's all right about that. Back to the cemetery for the count. You've straightened everything out, Maggie. I was hoping you would before the wedding day. Good girl. Andy, said Maggie, with a somewhat shy smile after she had been thoroughly assured of forgiveness. Did you believe all that story about the Count? Well, not entirely, said Andy, reaching for his cigar case, because it's Big Mike Sullivan's picture you've got in that locket of yours.